So now, Lord, here I stand. You gave me this word, and I feel very pregnant. And I'm going to deliver it now. And pray that the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, will be acceptable in thy sight. For you are my strength and my redeemer. Let the people say, Amen. If you're joining us for the first time, for the greater part of this year, I'll be walking through the book of Ephesians to see what message Paul has for us in that book. Today is the fourth of the 12 messages that I have. And I'd like you to take your Bibles in hand. Take your Bibles, take your instruments, take the Word. Take the Word in hand. I want you to be a part of this message today. And I want you to turn to the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians chapter 2. Last week, I finished chapter 1. We start today with chapter 2 and the first seven verses. I'm going to read that for you from the New International Version. Thank you. Ms. Morgan, for so ably and reading for us this morning. Good diction, good voice, good pause, good reading. And you, if you are there in the book of Ephesians, say amen. And you... He made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Mm. Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh. And of the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath, just as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us. Listen to me. Even when we were yet dead in our trespasses and sins. Made us alive together with Christ. And Paul puts in bracket there. By grace you have been saved. And he raised us up again together. Made us all sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us. In Christ Jesus on the church say, Amen. The series is Amazing Grace. 
part four. You, God has made alive. You are not alive because of you. God has made us alive. We who were dead in trespasses and sin, God has made us alive. You who are active, energetic, enjoying life, feeling fulfilled, feeling achieved. I have a little bad news for you today. If you are active and enjoying life, and you feel fulfilled, and you know not Jesus, you are dead. Dead. There are two words, Pastor, for dead in the scripture. One is thanatos, and the other is necros. One says that you're dead, 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 and the other said you're dead. One says you are physically dead. The other says you are spiritually dead. But I have a little theory. I don't know if it will come home to you. But I prefer to be physically dead. And dead in Christ. Than to be physically dead. And dead outside of Christ. When a man is physically dead, at least he has hope to live again. But when he's spiritually dead, that's it. So if you're having fun, having a good time, getting all you can and canning all you get, and you have not gotten Jesus, you are dead, Ellis Strong. Dead. Only dead people do some things I see people doing in the land. People who are spiritually dead will not. You, you wonder how could they do this? Why would a man walk into a workplace and take out his gun and just indiscriminately kill people? What, what's wrong with him? He's dead. Spiritually dead. Yeah, when people are spiritually dead, they are not able to respond to God in positive ways. When you are spiritually dead, you are incapable of doing anything to please God. So when you see people do foolish things, don't waste your brain trying to wonder how did it happen. It happened because they are spiritually dead. I'm afraid of people who are spiritually dead. You can leave home on Monday morning well dressed to go to work. And an, a, 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 a dopey, a, a dead person will come on the subway and kill you. A person who is spiritually dead is in a state of a lost sinner. When a man is lost or a woman is lost, the only way they can find their way is if they give themselves to God. Am I talking sense or nonsense here? It's a precarious place to be. To be living a life without God. I have never been able to understand how people once knew God have gone back like dogs to their vomits. 
I cannot understand how people who once worship in the church and know the truth and teach the truth and preach the truth have gone to live on truth. Never been able to understand how on a day like today, the Sabbath, when you once grew up in the church and came to service, that you can be in the world eating of the husk of the world. And part-time Christians are life-supported Christians. They are dying. People who don't have enough time for God. What will it profit you, the Bible asks, if you should do what? Gain, talk so everybody in the world can hear you. So that you gain the world and do what? Lose your soul. Tell me, tell me, tell me. What will it ever profit you when you come to kissing your dying pillar and you know not God? I told you about the greatest culture shock I have coming to this country, working as a chaplain, visiting the bedside of patients. And a man told me to get out of here, take your hell out of here with you and your God. In a few minutes, he was coded. And in a few minutes he was dead. And that thing bothered me. I couldn't sleep for a few days because I was wondering, was there something I could have done to leave my God with him? But he drove me out without his, with my God. What does it profit you? I have stood at the bedside of rich and famous people who would pay any money for another second to live. But they have died with big bank accounts. But there is no account in glory. What will it profit you my friend? If you are listening to me today don't tune me out. Stop. Look and listen. Because I have come to tell you this morning. That somebody needs to live. And somebody needs to live the godly life. Because only when you live for Christ that you are really living. Is somebody hearing me out there? I have been to a number of post-mortems. I have watched people who are dead. I, I, I have had a number of funerals. I, I go to so many funerals. Uh, that's sometimes I wonder. And I have found some characteristics of the dead. Number one, dead people are always unconscious. Life is passing by. I go to funerals and I hear them say that their loved one is in glory looking down on them and sheltering and protecting them. When you are dead, you are dead. Unconscious. Spiritually, when you are dead, you are unconscious. You, you can't even hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. He speaks and knocks and seeks permission. But you can't even hear because you are dead. You are dead. You are numb. You are deaf. And nobody can fix you when you are dead. I don't matter whether you have insurance or whether you don't have insurance. It doesn't matter whether you have money or you don't have money. You think some of these people who have died, if, 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 if doctors could give them life, they would have been dead? But I'm more concerned about life after life. And I can tell you this, when you live for Christ, you die once and live twice. When you live outside of Christ, you live once and die twice. Tell you it pays to serve Jesus. When somebody is dead, they are inactive. No communication. No interaction. No smile. No look. 
No change of expression. Have you ever been around a dead? I can't forget that Sabbath morning when my wife died. How I just shook her, shook her. I don't know where the adrenaline came from. And I shook and I called and I cried and I begged and I pleaded. And my dear wife lied there and would not even look at me. When you're dead, there's no communication, no interaction, no smile, no look, no nothing. Some of you have buried loved ones and you, you cried and you beg and you plead. You even want to go in the grave with them. And some of them would have lived if only you had stayed close to them before. When a man is dead... He begins to decay. He, he first goes through the process of rigor, mort rigor mortis. Then through the process of decay. Uh, they are burying this morning as I talk to you. Some folks are not in church because they are going to London. To the prince's funeral. Yeah. And they said, I heard it, that today when the service is over... They are going to put Prince Philip in a, vault, in, in a vault. In the family vault. He's going to be stored. He's going to be mummified. He's going to be there. He won't see decay. They are fix him up so well that they are going to put him as a, a monument. I guess Queen Elizabeth can go look him up every now and again. Ah, oh. decay. If you come to church and the gospel is preached and Jesus Christ is lifted up and you don't move and accept the call and the inv invitation of God, it is because you are dead, decaying, hardened. Uh, 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 you're spiritually dead. Am I talking language you can understand? I don't understand how some people go to church and the gospel moves them. And they never move. Never understand how the gospel's joyful sound that conquers sinners and comforts saints can't comfort some people. I can't understand how some people come to church and hear the gospel preach and leave church and go back and live life on the same level. Because Paul says, you are dead. You are dead in trespasses and sin. I don't understand. I don't understand how some people know what is right from what is wrong, but enjoy doing wrong and shunning right. I stand amazed. There's something about us that is crooked. We're out of alignment. And if we are not in alignment with Christ, we are, we, we are going to get fractured. Now I tell you a story. I like to tell stories. I like to tell stories. I came to church last week, Sabbath. Drove out to go home. And while I was driving home, the devil came to attack me on the Sabbath. While I was driving to go home, my, my dashboard lit up. And it told me that I am not to drive over 50 miles per hour. Your left right tire needs attention. Even a car speaks to me. And I listen. I was on my way down to Rome and I saw this place called Tire Fix. I'm not advertising for them. And I pulled in to Tire Fix. And they came and jacked up the car with us in there too. And the man came around to me and said, come and look here. I got up and when I looked, I went around there, Brother Tingling. 
the whole side of the tire was peeled off. If I had continued the journey, God knows what would have happened to me. I had to get a tire right there and then. And I said to the guy, what, what, I wonder what causes. He said, the car needs alignment. So Monday, I went and aligned my car because it has been driving better. I can almost sit around the steering and tell the car to go where it's going and it just keeps straight now. I don't have to be holding the steering wheel for it to be going. They, they align the car. They line up the car. Because if they don't line up the car, he said, I'm going to lose the other tires. So I come to church this morning to tell my believers, line up your life with Jesus. Because if you don't line up your life with Jesus, you're going to lose your life. You can't stay in sin so long that it feels normal. Sin must feel abnormal. Mm -hmm. Missing the mark. We call it a martyr. Missing the mark. No matter how hard you try to live right, you can't live right. So you've got to line up your life with Jesus. What a difference it makes when your life is lined up with Jesus. What a difference. You sleep good. You sleep at peace. I often wonder when these gunmen go out there and commit their crimes and kill people. Can they sleep? Yes, they do sleep because sin has become their new normal. Line up your life with Jesus. I know, yes, I know. You ask me and I tell you, yes, I know that with all our trying, we will fall short. We fall short, don't we? Mm -hmm. We fall. I fall short. If you're honest, you will say you fall short. The, 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 the best of us have shortcomings. Even Paul, you know. Here's what Paul says. And tell me if it sounds familiar. For we know that the law is spiritual and I am carnal under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would not, that I do. Sounds familiar? But what I hate, that I do. If then I do that which I would not, I consent under the law that it is good. Now, now, then, it is no more I that do, but sin that dwelleth in me. Paul says, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. Can somebody tell me in this church who taught a baby to lie? For the good I would, I do not. But the evil which I could not, that I do. Now, if I do, Paul is reasoning with you. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more, it is no more I that doeth it, but the sin that dwelleth it. I find then a law that when I would do good, say it, evil presents itself to me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my member warring against the law of my mind and bringing me in captivity to the law of sin which is in my member. Paul thought through this thing and said, man, there is this war 
uh, going on between good and evil. There, there is this war, this tension going on. I really want to do good, but I just end up doing bad. Why am I so naughty? And Paul described himself with a word uh, that is coarse. He said, oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of death? How am I going to get over this dilemma? And he thought about it. And then he said in verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord so that when with the mind I serve the law of God but with the flesh the law of sin. Paul said, boy, did I not try? But every time I try, it's the same outcome. There is this raging war going on within me. But I come to the point for the shout this morning. I'm down to verse 4 of Ephesians chapter 2. Paul rehearsed his life and his behavior and his attitudes. And he saw hopelessness. He saw death. But when he came to verse 4, he came with a shout. He said, but God. Say that everybody. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love. Is somebody following me this morning? With which he hath loved us. But God. I want to stop there a little. <laughs> but this week while I was working on this thing, you know, pastor. I was swinging there in my office. And I have a nice little office that none of you come to. But I was in the office sitting down undisturbed. Thinking about the text for today. And I was reading about Paul's life. And I, I began to personalize it. Bernard Robinson. Born in the church. Grown in the church. Went to church school. Became a pastor. Pastoring. And he has gone through so much, so much temptation, so much provocation, nearly lost my life, nearly lost my job, nearly lost my family. But God, we are here because of God. And you need to personalize that text that you, you would have been in some cemetery today, but for God. Some of you would have been in jail, but for God. That's the gospel in a capsule. That the sovereign God, the holy God, the mighty God, the blameless God, the sinless God is full of wrath against sin, but he is full of love towards sinners. That's the gospel in a nutshell. God stands opposed to sin, but God will stand up for sinners. We were dead, Paul says, in trespasses and sin. And thus we have become children of wrath. We stand in opposition to God. Yet God has made a way of escape for us God didn't leave us there to perish. No, he didn't. But God, what a God full of love. I wish I was preaching to some people this morning who know something about that love. I, I wish I was talking to somebody who has experienced that God love. What a God of love. He did not leave us to perish. Full of mercy, full of grace. Came down to my level when I could not go up to his. That's amazing grace. We are helpless, but God. Somebody called the church yesterday. And Sister Carol, the number got rooted to my phone. 
mysterious. She had a wonderful story to tell me about her sorrow, her pain. I won't call her name, but I can tell you the story. She's sick, has MS, 59 years old. Her mother is dead, her father is dead. She was an only child, no sibling, never married, no children. And she tried to explain to me, Mrs. Smart, through the phone, the pain she's going through. And I said, describe it to me. And the pain, she said in one sentence, is not so much the physical, but the psychological. I said to her, say more. She said, Pastor, you don't want to be here when the pain takes me. I have nobody to call and I have nobody to help. And in my chaplain's hat, Pastor Case, I said to her, what was your greatest fear? And she said, I'm glad you asked. I fear dying and dying alone. I have nobody. So what's your source of comfort? She said, that's why I call you. Because I recall my mother teaching me when I was a child a Bible text that I never forget. I think it is in the book called John. I don't remember the verse, but it said that God loved the world and God loved me. And I taught her the text and I taught her the reference. For those of you who don't know it, John 3.16. And she said, that's the only spiritual comfort. She said, I wish I could know the God of my mother. And we spent that whole hour and a half talking yesterday about the God of her mother. And she asked me, how can I know that God? Because that's all I can hold on to now. When it comes to hitting your dying pillow and you don't know God, you're hopeless. But God, God got her to call me yesterday. She never knew me. Never knew me. Never met me. Never heard my name. But she remembered that years ago, her mother used to go to an Adventist church and she went on Yellow Page and found one. And I to tell her about the grace of God. But God, who has made us, can make us alive in Christ. Even when we are dead in trespasses and sin. God said I have no delight in the death of a sinner. But that all will repent and come to life. That John 3.16 is more than a memory verse you know. For God, say it with me. For God so. And I want you to say me. For God so love. That he gave. His only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And by the way, did you know verse 17 is almost as powerful? For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved can I tell you something today it's hard to tell you I'll tell you this but listen to it you may want to tweet it too you, you, you may want to snapchat it too you, you may want to put it on Facebook you may, you, you may want to whatsapp it too that if you are lost it's nobody's fault but yours God has done everything possible to save you. And anybody who is lost 
is a bully. Because it is easier to be saved than to be lost. Did somebody hear me out there? For you to be lost, you got to bully yourself past the Holy Spirit. You got to bully yourself past Jesus. You got to bully yourself past the cross. And you got to bully yourself past the angels. If you are lost, it's nobody's fault but yours. The greatest decision you will ever have to make in life is whether you want to be lost or to be saved. Because even though you were born in trespass and sin, even though you were born in sin and shapen in iniquity, and we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but God, who is rich in grace and mercy because of his great love, wants to save us. Wants to save us. God gave us the privilege of having new life in Christ. I'm happy for that. I, I sit down every now and again and I begin to think, I begin to think, I begin to wonder. If I did not know this Christ, where would my life take me? I would be on some highway to destruction. I, I don't know if I would still be alive. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. But I, I, I just feel like shouting. But God. Who is rich. In grace. And mercy. Because of his great love. Has made a provision. For me to be saved. Uh -huh. And I want young ones to listen to me. When I gave my heart to Jesus, I was a preteen. And oh boy, they bothered me at school, you know. They just wanted me to do something wrong for them to laugh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some say they don't know how long I keep it out. Oh, yes, yes, yes. But you know something? I take off my glass to tell you this today. That all that I am and ever hope to be, I owe it to the church. Mm -hmm. This church gave me something to live for. Something to hope for. This church gave me direction. And I thank God. That 52 years ago when I got baptized. I never knew where I was going, but I know who was leading me. And I followed him. And I'm going to follow him every day of my life because of his great love for me. Look at me. God shouldn't love somebody like me, you know. For one, I'm short. I've sinned and come short. Number two, I'm black. Black in America is a scourge. Yeah. So if God was looking for some pretty people, he certainly... Would not stop my way. I'm short. I'm black. <laughs> but look at me. Out of the five billion people upon the face of the earth. God. But God. In his love and mercy. Rescued me. Look at you. Look at you. Were it not for God. You've been lost and done. But I'm glad to tell you today, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. Why are you saying amen for that? Any woman is in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are what? Pass away. And all things have become new. Pastor, you know that in my training in psychotherapy, you had to tell your story. And you are not to sanitize it <clears throat> and you're not to color it you are to just tell it write it and we, we have in the training what is called sacred space that what you say in there stay in there 
Some of you couldn't tell your story. It is too gory. Some of you can't tell your story. It's too hoary. Some of you can't tell your story. It's too ugly. But God, look beyond the ugliness and the goriness. God, look beyond the past and said, if you come to me, my child, I will give you a new life and all things will be passed away and all, all things will become new. And when Jesus buries your sin in the depths of the ocean, not even a scuba diver can find it. But God, for his grace, his mercy, his love, he has given us the spirit of reconciliation to bring us back to him. Estrange my sin, but God, thank you God for grace. There's no other name for grace but amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing what God can do for a sinner who comes home. It's amazing what God did for my little blondie. I was someplace having a meetings, having some evangelistic meetings. Oh, I love those days. And I was out visiting one day and I saw this beautiful young lady walking on the street, coming up. She was bedecked that you could not but observe her. And I pick a chat with her. I pick a chat with her. Yeah. She was a little stush, but she chat with me. And I told her that I was a pastor in town. You know, even though I'm preaching pastor, I go visit. I'm the pastor in town. I'm running the meetings of the tent down there. I'm inviting you to come along. And she tell me almost every night she has an appointment because she worked at the go-go club. And she said nights are her best business time. You're listening to me? Yeah. Her best business time. And I said even one night for me. You wouldn't come one night? She said okay I'll come Thursday evening because Thursday evening is slow. And I said, but we don't have meetings on Thursday. So speed up Thursday and come another night. Well, I got Blondie to come to the meeting on Friday night. And the Spirit of the Lord was up on me. And I preached a message that night that I didn't know she was in the crowd, but she was there. And she came to me at the end of the meeting and she, she was crying. And I asked her, why tears? She said, you preach on me tonight. I said, I did. That must have been a good message then. And I asked her, what, what did I preach on that is so much you? And she told me. Began to have visits with Blondie. Very careful to go to see her pastor. Very careful. I visited her cautiously with company. And I noticed she kept coming to the meeting, even though nights were supposed to be busy for her. And the Sabbath, I had Sabbath celebration. And who did I see in my congregation but Blondie? I visited her the next day. And we sat down to talk. And Blondie said to me, Pastor, I need to say something to you, but I'd like to say it to you alone. I had two other people with me. I asked them to sit in the car. And we sat on the veranda. And she told me her story. And I listened to her story. And I remember like it was yesterday. The only response I said to her is that you are too beautiful to be abused. And I spoke to her. 
And when the time came for baptism, I won't ever forget it. It was February 14 in that year, Valentine's Day. I made an appeal for people to fall in love with Jesus. And I told them that Jesus is the only lover you will ever have that will never abuse you. And Blondie decided to get baptized. I'm talking about but God. She had gone through so much in her young life. Beautifully ugly. Now, when Blondie decided to be baptized, words got around. And the morning of the baptism at the river, Blondie, there was crowd at the river. People came from everywhere, even some of her customers. And when we went in the river to baptize her, they said, drown her, pastor. Drown her. And I was so happy. I had Blondie in my arms. I patted her. And I said, you'll not drown. You're going to be happy ever after. Baptize Blondie. I'm talking about but God. Blondie became a member of the church and she had to pass the club where she served to go to church. She didn't drive. She walked. And they would whistle at her, call at her, made snide remarks on her, say all manner of evil against her, but God. Blondie came in the church. I told you she was a pretty girl. And if I tell you she was pretty, you know I know what pretty is. And Blondie came in the church. One day, one day Blondie came to me with a form to fill out, Ella Mitchell. A form to fill out. When I looked on the form, she wanted to go to West Indies College. Man, is the quickest signature I ever put on. She went to West Indies College, studied, became a teacher. I told you she was pretty. Yeah, she was. She met a nice guy on campus, Pastor. Yeah, somebody like you. Nice guy. <laughs> and she married that young pastor. And now she's a shepherdess. Helping people to see a better life. But God. But God. I, I just stopped by here to tell you this morning. No matter how messed up you are. God has the chemical to clean you up. And you will never be the same again. Lost people can find their way back to God. Because God never forget that you were born in sin and shape and in iniquity. God knows that there is a remedy for sin. And that remedy is available to you this morning. Let me wrap it up. Lost people, depraved people, the wrath of God is upon them. The holy anger of God should be against them. But when you accept Jesus, you become a friend of God. When you become a friend of God, you have a good friend, you know. A friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Is somebody hearing me out there this morning? Somebody who will never scandalize you. Somebody who promises that when he buries your sin, he buries them at the depths of the ocean, never to be remembered anymore. God don't keep those in his computer software, nor hardware. When God forgives you, the past is covered. The blood covers the past. I think everybody you keep as friend and share your secret to, is stay with them. When your friend become your foe to the whole world, your secret go. But when you have a man named Jesus who is your friend, he will be trustworthy. Friend, is somebody hearing me here this morning? I don't have much to give you, but I give you Jesus. I don't have money to give you, but I tell you about God. God, God, no matter how rich you are, educated you are, sophisticated you are, 
popular you are. Without Jesus, you are dead. Dead. I say you're dead. Without Jesus, you may have a PhD, but without Jesus, you're an educated derelict. You may have money, but without Jesus, you are a rich devil. Yeah. You may have fame and fortune, but without Jesus, all you have is shame and misfortune. And if you continue to live in that type of living very soon, God is going to declare you dead. Dead. And leave you up to your reprobate mind. Called my wife this week and she took the phone and she quickly said to me, Can't talk to you right now. Can't talk to you right now. I, I have a dead to go and pronounce. And these days, God is going to pronounce you dead. And when the certificate is written up, you're dead. But I'm here to tell you today you don't have to die, you can live. You can live, but you can't live without Jesus. Pastor, I don't know if you feel the same pain I feel when I offer people Jesus and they just shrug him off. When I was growing up as a boy, and let me tell you, you may know this story. Pastor John Calvin Palmer was a conference evangelist in West Jamaica. And who would have thought that one of my admired heroes would have left a footprint for me to follow him? J.C. Palmer, great preacher. His wife became my English teacher in high school, Miss May. And every night before J.C. Palmer preached, Aunt May would sing. And the song that she led the tent into singing went something like this. Without him, I can do nothing. Without him, I'd be enslaved. Without him, life would be hopeless. Like a ship Without a sail. Jesus. Oh Jesus. Do you know him today? Jesus. Oh Jesus. Please. Don't turn me away. Jesus. Oh Jesus. Without him. How lost. I would be. Paul said we were lost. Dead, done, without God and his son. But he reached down his hand for me. His grace came down to me at my level. And I pray somebody who hear this word from Paul today. Will see yourself as wretched. Lost. Undone. Without God and his son. That you will see the love that Jesus has for you. That he was willing to die for you. To rescue you. And I'm speaking to you out there. I'm speaking to you in here. And I'm wondering if somebody is listening to me today. Would want to say from this 21st from the 17th day of April. I want to live a life of life, not a life of sin. And I want to give my heart to Jesus like Gandhi. Right where you are, you can make that decision now. There's a link on your system there. You can go right there. And make a response right there. And Pastor Case and I will be so happy. So ever so happy. To come and share our best friend with you. 
And I'm wondering if in the house today, there's somebody here who has put the spotlight on your own soul. You're right now you're examining yourself and you want to say, Pastor, I can't tell my story here. But this day in the courts of the Lord, I want a new beginning with Jesus. If there's such a person who would want to raise your hand, raise your hand upstairs, downstairs. We can pray for you in this closing moment. But God, who is full of love and grace and mercy, wants to rescue you. God sees all those hands raised wherever they are raised. And I pray that you'll not be pronounced dead. But one of these days you'll hear the voice of Jesus saying, Come, come ye blessed of my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of this world. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.